Can everybody hear me okay? I'm Miriam Rubin. It's really a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. I'm the kind of person who really likes to celebrate anniversaries. And whoop. Wow, that got quiet. So I, I'm Miriam Rubin, and it's just such a pleasure to be able to talk to you tonight. I was asked to speak a little bit about the climate action teams. I'm a person who likes to celebrate anniversaries. So um, this being a big anniversary for us with the one year after the climate march, thanks for having such a nice party for us. A year ago, when I went to New York with a lot of people who are here, I was just finishing up two years of graduate study, trying to wrap my mind around communicating climate change in a way that motivated people to take action instead of just being paralyzed with fear. Because it, that's hard to do, because it's pretty terrifying. It terrifies me just to think about what might happen. So it was incredible to be at that climate march with so many people speaking with one voice. And individually, you know, we were just a drop in the bucket, in, absolutely insignificant. But taken with a couple hundred thousand strong, it was a human tidal wave. It was fantastic. And it made the task ahead really clear that we had to translate all that energy into action in our own communities when we got back. That's what the Sierra Club Maine climate action teams have done. It's created a vehicle for people to take the next step beyond the changes we make at home with driving less or recycling more or changing out light bulbs or remembering my reusable shopping bags more times than not. Um, we can come together as a community and take bigger actions to ensure a stable climate future. So those projects now that are running, like in Brunswick, to ban the plastic bags, and in Wiscasset to work with people in town government to put solar on municipal buildings, and in Phippsburg to weatherize homes with Habitat for Humanity, and in Portland and Kennebunk and Freeport to work educating people and exploring the potential for community solar farms. Those are really important projects, but they still could feel kind of like a drop in the bucket when you look at the bigger scale of the problem. So I want to tell you a little story about a drop in the bucket because that all adds up and those projects do contribute to starting a movement. My kids were home recently and they were admiring the solar system that we put in this summer in our place in Buxton. So we have 24 305 watt panels on an all sun tracker. It's pretty nice. It's a far cry from what they grew up with 26 years ago in western Washington on a little homestead in the woods with six 60 watt panels and a battery bank trying to store and collect as much sun as we could given that we were in the rainforest. Um, it was fun. It was a little rough. We didn't have indoor plumbing. We had a pitcher on the side of the sink and you tip it and the water runs, so that was running water. The kids were little, they didn't know any better. And we had the bucket and chuck it wastewater system because under the kitchen sink we had a bucket and when you have to haul all your own drinking water, you get pretty good at monitoring your water use. So we would have a sense of how often during the day to empty the bucket and you just take it and chuck it out the door on the garden and that's the bucket and chuck it wastewater. And that worked really well for about six or seven years until my mother-in-law came to stay with us. <laughs> and unfortunately, she had Alzheimer's. So we were scared to death that she might get lost on her way to the outhouse, which if you're not familiar with the Olympic rainforest, that's actually a very real possibility. So we put in indoor plumbing. That was coming up in the world. That was good. Didn't take us too long to get used to that. But we did it all ourselves, and we're not plumbers. So we had this pesky little leak that kept on dripping just every now and then under the kitchen sink. And if you lived in a small place, you'll know that you always have every available space crammed with things for storage. So the cabinet under the kitchen sink was valuable storage, but we still had the bucket under there to catch the drip. And to this day, I cannot hear somebody say, oh, it's just a drop in the bucket without Picturing, yeah. It was crazy time. We were milking seven or eight goats and living off the grid. We didn't have a lot of refrigeration, so we were milking and making cheese just about every day. And we were 
just growing most of our own food, which in Western Washington, the gardening season is about 12 and a half months long. And we had homeschooling, four kids, plus watching a very sweet but energetic and unpredictable little old lady with Alzheimer's. So you can believe that some things fell through the cracks. And you come running through the house going from here to there and you see a little moisture on the floor in front of the sink and you kind of think, oh darn, the kids slopped water out and you give it a swab with your sock on the way by. But you come back later to make dinner and there's a puddle in front of the sink and you figure out actually no, it wasn't the kids, it was the bucket overflowing. Because I can tell you that every drop in the bucket actually contributes and you never know when it's going to be the one that tips it over and causes a flood or in our case starts a movement. So I, I encourage you if you're sitting at a table with somebody and you want to know more about the climate action teams or how you can start one, how they started theirs, what their projects are, talk to them, talk to me, talk to Glenn. We have a conference coming up in the end of October, October 17th at Unity College. It's going to be our second grassroots climate action conference. The Unity Gathering is going to be a chance for people to get skills and learn technical information about projects that could be um, climate action team projects in their communities and learn about community organizing and fundraising. It's going to be a really great gathering, a chance to network with people and get inspired if you're not already inspired to start a climate action team in your town because any project that contributes to a clean energy, stable climate future can be an organizing goal for a climate action team. Um, it reminds me of my favorite Jane Goodall quote, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. And the climate action teams are just a fantastic way to help people who don't yet think of themselves maybe as climate activists to get involved and start making a difference. It's the perfect way to think globally and act locally. I couldn't think of a better way to be thinking global and acting local now. Which is a great segue to our speaker, who's very busy acting globally. John Cookett is the director of the National Sierra Club's federal and international climate campaign based in Washington, D.C. John oversees our international energy, trade, and global environment programs, and also leads the Sierra Club's lobbying at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the White House. John brings nearly two decades of experience working in Washington on these issues. Prior to Sierra Club, he worked on Greenpeace's International Climate Team and for the Environmental Working Group and the Environmental Law and Policy Center. John has been quoted and interviewed in numerous national media outlets, including NBC Nightly News, BBC, Fox News, Reuters TV, National Public Radio, CBS Radio, and Al Jazeera. John is originally from Minnesota and was educated at Williams College and the University of Chicago Public School, School of Public Policy. He's a cross-country skier and a big fan of the Rumford Ski Area, and he also wanted you to know that his sister attended Bates, so he's got some connection to Maine. We're delighted to have John in Maine to share his perspective on addressing the climate crisis. Please join me in welcoming him. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I, I haven't been to Maine in a long time, and it's always a challenge when you leave Washington, D.C. You see how nice it is everywhere else. <laughs> it's a real risk that you're not going to want to go back. It's a common problem we have in the office when people go on vacation. They, uh, they come back and start complaining about the weather and the situation and the cost of living. And, um, Anyway, it's, uh, it's really nice to be here. My sister really did go to Bates, and I, uh, I helped make that happen, so it's my, my one little connection. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about Paris, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about sort of how we got to it and why local action is important on climate change. So, so I've sp I spent a lot of time earlier in the year arguing with the White House over what our pledge should be in Paris. And uh, we had a lot of meetings. We argued about EIA projections and other technical things. But the, what that real discussion was about was what does all of the local action, the national policies, the state policies, all of that add up to? And therefore, what can the United States pledge in Paris? And that, 
that argument, that ongoing argument, is really just the summation of action that has been built up in the United States. The same thing happened when we argued with the White House under the Bush administration, and they did exactly the same thing. They made a pledge that was based on all the action that they had opposed over the last many years, but they, but they actually did the same thing. It's the, it's the way this process works. And in Paris, all countries will come together, and they will put down exactly the same kind of a pledge, which will be based on what their domestic policy can bear and how far those countries can get and what the options are. And it's true that some countries will be motivated by the spirit of the moment and they will pledge more and some countries will help push other countries further by offering finance. But the basic deal is always the same. And I would argue you can basically draw a straight line from what the Sierra Club has done on the auto industry standards. When we basically pushed the, the Detroit and the administration by running campaigns in states, getting states to adopt California car standards and then forcing a national standard, culminating in this administration's decision to, to push much stronger standards for both cars and trucks. The coal campaign pushing incredibly hard. And the, to retire coal plants all around the country, which created an incredible amount of space for the Environmental Protection Agency to finally issue final standards on the Clean Power Plan, which creates a huge ability for this administration to pledge in Paris. That is the, the single most important thing that allowed them to get to 28%. And the same thing is happening now on methane rules and on a whole host of other things the administration is doing. These are all enabled by local action. The, these administrations do not just go off and lead in a direction and, and actually come up with these numbers out of thin air. They're all based on local action, where they're being pushed, who's supporting them, even in, in places like Texas. It's just absolutely the case. And it's not just in the US. I mean, in the international program, we see it all around the world. We support communities in Burma, Pakistan, South Africa, um, India, where they're fighting coal. And it's amazing to see what happens there. We, we have colleagues that we work with in India who describe a scene that they, they actually describe it as being like that scene in Braveheart, where people line up and go at each other, but it was the local police and the community that didn't want the coal plant. Because being displaced from your land in India is basically a death sentence. And they were not going to give up their land without a fight, and the fight ended up with five people dead. So you, you, it's easy when you sit in the United States to think that like we're on the forefront of environmental action. But people are fighting this fight everywhere, all around the world. And um, so let me just talk a little bit about Paris, because Paris is really exciting. And it's easy to get caught up, and I'm sure you're all going to get emails from environmental groups who are going to complain that Paris isn't adding up, that we're off the two-degree path, and this is a disaster. But Paris is a historical opportunity to flip the narrative on climate change. Ever since Kyoto, and the, there was a vote in the, in the Senate that was this horrible bird haggle resolution. It was 95 to nothing. The basic premise was, unless all countries are, action, are acting on climate, we shouldn't do anything. And that has been the narrative in the United States ever since. And it's been a huge problem. Every time we would go meet with Senator Bai from Indiana, <laughs> Senator Bai would say, I want to vote for climate change, but I can't do it until we solve the coal problem and the China problem. And he would, I mean, he would actually say this, you know, we, I'm, I won't vote for it. And it was, it was basically the dilemma that we've had. That is going to change in December. We, we will actually have a deal that has all major emitting countries on board. The, the whole system will be roughly parallel between developing and developed countries, and we will be able to use that to defend local action. So we'll flip the narrative. You guys can go around and say, I support what the president is doing on climate change, and as a result, this is what I'm doing here, and we're doing this to make sure that, you know, to help the president get where he needs to go. 
And this is just a huge fundamental shift. And this is why Senator McConnell is attacking us at every turn. He's actually meeting with embassies, running around, his staff is going to embassies, and they're basically telling everybody that they're gonna fight so that the president can't deliver in Paris. And the wonderful thing about this is that we can go meet with him and sort of laugh and say, you're not gonna succeed. We've seen this before, Senator Vitter's done it, since, uh, Congressman Sensenbrenner, and it just doesn't work. The really international community can see right through it. And they can see that he's losing, that the clean power plan is moving forward, that he doesn't have the votes, although he has an awful lot of them, and we're making progress. The, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that the actions that other countries are taking, particularly China, are insanely impressive. China is gonna build more renewable energy than exists as power capacity in the entire United States as part of its pledge. It is an immense undertaking, the largest effort to decarbonize that's ever been made in the world. And, um, and you see huge goals from India to do solar and other countries. So the, the developing country pledges are at least as impressive as what we're doing. What we're doing is hard because it's a transition away from something, and you have to shut down coal plants, and we all know how hard that is. The, the other thing that's happening this year that I, I really wanted to point out is the encyclical has just been huge. If it weren't for the U.S.-China agreement on climate change, the encyclical would be the biggest thing that had ever happened on climate change. The, the Pope is a wonderful messenger. He's reaching people that we can't reach. There's polling that's coming back now that's showing that that's absolutely true. And you know we see in Washington next week, I get to work from home for three days because the Pope is showing up, which is kind of an amazing thing when you think about it. One guy comes to town and we get to work from home for three days. But um, he, he is being just absolutely inundated by the Republicans who want to come meet him with him in person. You're just looking through the, the list of swing senators. We've got Vitter, Toomey, Murkowski, Collins, Ayotte, Hove, and Rubio are all Catholic. On the Democratic side, it's even more impressive, really. Manchin, McCaskill, Casey, Donnelly, Hyde, Kane. That's basically the only Democrats I try to work with anymore because they're the only swings. He is an, it's an incredibly important thing that's happening, and I think it's going to make a huge difference. And we're working with the Catholics very well. That's the other amazing switch that's happened, is that they're now our friends, and we lobby together, and it's, it's been incredibly effective. <laughs> so the other big change is that we're no longer on a path to five degrees. That was the case before. It was the case right up until the Paris pledges started coming in, and not, now we're on roughly a three-degree pathway, which is not great. There's, there's some space there, but it's an incredibly big difference. And you know, I think it's easy to, when you're working on climate, it's easy to get caught up in the fact that you know, we're not where we need to go, and we have a long way to go, but that's, that's gonna be true for quite some time. The, Success on climate change requires this incredible transformation of the economy. Moving away from coal and oil, that's not gonna happen quickly. And it's not gonna happen quickly around the world. So the fact that we've gone over short, such a short period of time from you know, clearly being on a five degree pathway, we have the World Bank writing reports about the disaster of a four degree pathway, to being in a much safer climate zone around three, which is clearly not good, but it's a huge improvement. So let me just talk briefly about what we're fighting for in Paris. So the basic premise of what's gonna be done is already set. They agreed more than a year ago that all countries to put together their pledges over this summer. The US and China have already done theirs. A whole bunch of countries have put their pledges forward. Some of them good, like the US and China. Some of them bad, like Russia's, which is ridiculous, and, and a few other countries, but the pledges are coming in. That is not going to be the problem in Paris. The problem in Paris is going to be finance, and many developed countries are not in a great position to deliver money. We aren't going to deliver the money that is needed, and that is because the president doesn't control it. It's a, the Republicans have the power of the purse. So the big question in Paris is going to be whether developing countries are willing to go forward in the absence of the deal that they always wanted. 
And the answer is going to be yes, because they've already basically made this decision. Those pledges that came in did not include financing pledges, because it was clear to them that that wasn't going to happen and that they need climate action as much as anybody else. So they're going to live to fight another day on finance. There'll be a finance package that comes together, but it's not going to be the finance package that the world needs. So what's left to fight over is three basic things that are really forward-looking elements, which is what we always need out of these climate deals. They, what, what can actually get agreed upon at the meeting is what the countries come prepared to do. They come with these thick binders of negotiating instructions. And they have all these red lines, and th those have already been decided. And they have people walking around and making sure they stay on that, that side. I actually once walked home from a negotiation with a US negotiator. There's this guy next to us with this beeping briefcase. And I finally just like, what is that? And he said, oh, he just works for the NSA. So you know, you know that they're paying attention. You know, he probably had some weird phone. I don't know what the deal is. But, but in the end, what matters in these agreements is that the countries can come together and, and agree to keep working together. And in Paris, there are three big things that are left to be decided. The first is whether there's going to be a long-term goal. Uh, the U.S. agreed in the G7 negotiations earlier this summer with this sort of vague language that we would decarbonize the global economy in the course of this century. So this is important because that's actually a science-based statement. In order to be on a two-degree pathway, the world needs to be decarbonized by 2070, which is kind of an amazing thing. I mean, it seems like it's a long way off, but really if you're talking about getting rid of coal and gas and oil, and dealing with uh, fluorocarbons and all the other problems we have, to do that by 2070 is an amazing thing. So that's within the course of the century, and that's the statement they came up with. We all thought that it would die at that, because getting countries to agree to that, developed countries that can see a path forward is one thing, but developing countries do not like that statement. They have a lot of development yet to do, and they see that as a real threat. Um, but uh, earlier this month, the Germans got the Brazilians to agree to that language as well. So now there's a hope that there'll be some clear statement on the long-term goal. And, and that's necessary because unless countries agree where we're headed, it's very difficult in this new world where we're just doing these pledges with review processes to actually get where we need to go. So that's great. The other two big things, the first is this notion that we're going to reevaluate periodically. They're pushing for a five-year review cycle. This is a, something we're familiar with in this country because the Clean Air Act is founded on these review cycles that are basically the same. We have a five-year review cycle on ozone, which results in a review every seven to 11 years. Um, we're about to finalize one in a few days, and we're all pushing for 60 and hoping for 65. Um, and then the big question is, what is the degree of monitoring and evaluation? H how do we know that countries are following the, what they've put forward? That I'm certain they'll come to an agreement on. I think it could be that there's some differentiation between what developing countries have to do there and developed. Some countries aren't really in a great position to know what their emissions are, but we're fixing that with satellites and other things. And I'm, I'm certain that we'll get to yes on that and the Chinese will, will help us get there. So, so the main pieces that are outstanding are all reconcilable. The pledges are coming in and they are decent. Um, and I think, the, but to, to me, the absolute biggest thing here, the real takeaway is the flipping of the narrative. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've been on the Hill where this this notion that why should we do something until other countries take action has come up. And even though it's not entirely fair, particularly in the case of India, it is absolutely an, an essential problem that we needed to overcome. And this administration solved it. And they did that for, with two things. One is that they were pretty tough. They were not um, popular with this move. They turned the system that everyone wanted to be, the, what we called the fab deal, the fair, ambitious, and binding, into a system that is a pledging system, where you voluntarily put forward your, your reduction targets. 
And that seemed at the time like just a disaster. Of course, it was necessary in our country, but a disaster. But it's turning out to be a really important difference because now all countries can put something voluntarily forward. And then the other, the other reason that they did that is that they actually have exerted a huge amount of leadership on climate change. I know that a lot of people have issues with the president on climate and, and a whole bunch of other things, and we are actually going to win on Keystone. I can't tell you when, but we are actually going to win. But, but the president has owned this. He has brought up climate and brought up these pledges and brought up coal financing abroad in every meeting he's had at the head of state level. And that kind of leadership is what we really needed on climate. And there are other partners in that. There's absolutely no doubt the, the Chancellor of Germany is, is equally strong on this. And there are some others. And the French government is going to be good because the, the meetings are in Paris. But this has been an essential element of progress on climate change. And it's, it's easy to overlook it because you think that's, of course, what the president would do. But this president has really owned it ever since we got the Affordable Care Act across the finish line. And uh, it's, been, it's been a huge change. The other thing I would say that has changed, that the change that was really noticeable from my standpoint, was um, when Podesta came into the White House. John Podesta is an incredible force of nature. That, that's been a huge thing for us. And, and he's the reason that we're going to win on Keystone. So, so that's good. So I, I'm happy to answer questions. I think that's always better in this kind of a situation. So yeah, I do see a future for legislation. I don't know if it'll be cap and trade or a tax system or something else. But I, I can tell you this, that the, the clean power plan can be strengthened over time. It, it, it absolutely can. But it's not. Relying on the Clean Air Act to handle this problem is, is not a great solution. It, um, it's a tool that has limits. It has limits that it really only can deal with existing power plants. It has limits that it only deals with power plants. And so in the long run, we, we need a different, we need a legislative solution. I think everybody in Washington understands that. But um, we're a few votes away. <laughs> and uh, we passed the Affordable Care Act under a thing called reconciliation, which is just sort of a tricky way of inserting legislation into the budget process. And then it gets you a 50 vote threshold. And ever since that, in the budgeting process, a Republican has introduced a motion that basically says, now you guys can't do cap and trade on reconciliation. So we need 60 votes. We've got 46, <laughs> so we've got a little ways to go. But we've got both of the main senators, and that's good. So Paris is like, uh, it's like a lobby week, but every government is there, and they're only there for those two weeks, and that's it. So it's a little bit like a state legislative process, but it's international. So it's just chaos, and there are, <laughs> Thousands of negotiators, everyone's got their binders, right? And they, they know exactly what they're going to do. But then it's, it's kind of a crazy system. So basically, what you do in Paris is two things. One is you run around trying to make sure that your government isn't backtracking on its position. And then you move intel between the NGOs from the US and the NGOs from other countries and make sure that no one's doing anything crazy because they don't understand what other countries are doing. Um, we did this a lot in the Bush administration. We spent a huge amount of time trying to explain to other countries what's going on here and the fact that they were actually not um, unwilling to move things forward because that was the understanding. And that sort of culminated in Bali in a giant blow up where the US sort of pretended like it was going to stop things but really didn't intend to. Um, in these meetings, I think the bigger issue is going to be the finance side. And so we're going to spend a huge amount of time explaining our congressional system and the limits that that places on the president and defending the, the situation. Because the biggest problem in Paris in any of these negotiations is that the advocates and the other countries and everyone get carried away with the process and they decide that we can do this. We can solve climate change right here and now. 
and we're going to like move beyond, and the U.S. is going to pledge something better, and then so is China. And, but you have to have a reality-based system because countries come in with what they can do. There's maybe a little leeway, but it's not a lot. And if everyone doesn't stick to a reality-based lobbying process, then you get huge blow-ups, bad outcomes, and that's basically what happened in Copenhagen. The global strategy in Copenhagen was very simple. Put huge amounts of pressure on the U.S. president. He moves away from 14% to some 20% or other number. All these other countries get all excited, and they pledge more into a binding system that requires a ratified treaty, and then we all go home happy. But it, it wasn't going to happen. The U.S. didn't have the votes for a treaty. Moving away from 14% would have killed the Senate bill, so they weren't going to do that. And all we had was money, so we pledged that we'd deliver $100 billion in finance by 2020. And now we're arguing over whether we're on track to do that. So I think the big innovation in Paris is that this process is understood. The, the, the basic framework is clear. The pledges are already going to be in. And the process is going to work out more or less as everyone expects. And all the people running this process are absolute, clear, reality-based folks. The, the president of the COP is a, wom a woman who absolutely understands what happened in Copenhagen and won't let it happen again. So I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. But I think that the, the give and take there is just that Paris isn't going to solve climate change. We have a lot of work to do after Paris. And the two biggest things are delivering on the US target and getting the Chinese to deliver on their target. So there are two ways that plays out in, oh, sorry. So the basic question is, what will happen in Paris to deal with the needs of the world's poor impacted by climate change? And this has been the, basically the fundamental problem of dealing with climate change at the international level. There are two basic things that developing countries are asking for, both of them incredibly reasonable. One of them sounds like it's unreasonable and it's been a sticking point, but I think it's going to be resolved in Paris in a decent way. And so the first is there's a, a, a dis, uh, negotiation track around loss and damage. So these are countries that have impacts on climate change, that problems that hurt the country, cause damage to the country, and they want a mechanism within the treaty that compensates them for that damage. Now, Saudi Arabia would say that that includes the fact that they can't sell all of their oil. That's not what this is about. <laughs> but there's a number of countries that have there's smaller countries and say a hurricane or something else can do damage that's so severe, like we've seen more recently in the Philippines, that the country itself can't afford to deal with the problem. And that's really what loss and damage is about. Um, there are big insurance companies now that are offering products to countries to deal with that. And the expectation is that the globe is going to figure out how to handle that through this loss and damage track. It's not going to be in the final text in a way that binds countries to it, but it's going to make it into the final text, and we've made a huge amount of progress on that. Uh, the U.S. is finally okay with it. I think a lot of countries are. The, the other place is finance, and we have a green climate fund that the Obama administration wants to fund but isn't happening, mostly because the Republicans refuse to fund it. McConnell is actually saying he's going to have a sense of the Senate vote this fall, to deny it right before Paris. Um, I don't know if he's going to do it because he doesn't have very many legislative days and he's got a lot of problems right before Paris that have nothing to do with climate change. So there I think there's a bigger problem. The idea has been all along of the, of the developing countries that half that money would go to adaptation. There's a desire to specify that and I think there's an interest in sorting that out to some degree. But I think mostly because of the recession and for other reasons, I think it's unlikely that this is going to be the cop where we finally do something decent on adaptation. 
There was a, a meeting, a, the same meeting occurred in Nairobi several years ago, back when I worked for Greenpeace, and that was gonna be the adaptation COP, and, and that was the whole focus of it. There was no mitigation, anything on the table. It was an in-between year, and we restarted the five-year plan on adaptation. That was the outcome of that. This has been a really difficult thing to solve. And um, you know, even when you're in Nairobi, the best you can do, evidently, is just punt for another five years. But I, I think countries understand this, that, that this needs to be dealt with. I think it's tough, though. I think the best hope is actually that the military gets involved and convinces the Republican leadership that the destabilization caused by climate change is something that needs to be addressed head on. And they've made a lot of progress on that, but there's a long way to go. So um, the solar industry did something. Oh, so the question is, what are the, what's the prospect for renewing the solar investment tax credit? This is the big tax credit for solar. It's driven a huge amount of investment in solar up till now. And um, it's important to the work that you're all doing, especially around uh, community solar, which is really awesome. So uh, the Solar Industry Association got a multi-year extension of that several years ago, and it's the reason that the Roan who runs the Solar Association is still there, because that was really good work. And now it's coming to a head in 2016, and it's coming to a head in the middle of these giant fights across the country over between basically the solar industry and the coal industry and to a lesser degree the natural gas industry. The utilities are totally afraid of what solar is doing to their market share. They're right to be afraid of that. Obviously, it's been exaggerated some, but it's a huge fight. And the other factor that's playing into this is the solar industry is actually getting pretty big and powerful. And that's happening all around the country. And we see more and more conservatives coming to the table. The Sierra Club had a partnership with some of the Tea Party in Georgia, but we, we see this sort of independent streak coming into the solar industry, and there's you know just more and more business people who are involved in that. That being said, I think it's gonna be really tough to extend that, and my hope and dream for the Sierra Club on renewable energy over the next year is that you all and us at the national office find a way to coordinate the vast army of installers on solar and turn them and us into a political force on this. Because in the end, the solar industry's success is the most important thing to solving climate change. That's true in the United States, and that's true abroad. The fact that right now, Solar is solving the, one of the most vexing problems that we've had in the world, which is the lack of access to electricity among the world's poor. And solar is solving this problem, and it's solving it fast. It's just a huge, huge thing in our international efforts. When the head of the new prime minister of India was elected, Modi, his main pledge to the people of India was that he was going to solve energy access by 2022 using solar. There was no talk of coal, no talk of gas. So when you take that and then you take the incredible progress we're making domestically on solar and put them together, I, I personally believe that that is the political force that solves this in the end. And there's no other, I mean, wind is great, but it's just not the same as what solar does to community activism. <laughs> Thank you very much.